traveling the world seeing the seventh wonders of the world right so many different inspirations and aspirations but you know what our only desire should be to see Jesus our desire should be to be in his presence day in and day out worshiping his name because he is holy I don't think you understand the the significance many people have dreams I'm a dreamer I don't know about you guys but I'm a dreamer I dream all the time, but my biggest dream and the number one dream it always lands on is the words, let me see you, let me see Jesus. And whatever that means to you, whatever that means to you, I hope at the end of the day, your desire, your one true desire is to seek his face and to be in his presence. The beautiful thing is that there's a song that talks about just that. the top of my lungs my heart's still reaching for something deeper something more give me old give me new i just want to sing the truth here in these praises let me see jesus and is anyone
face It's all for you My heart's ovation It's all for you Heaven's procession It's all for you A song of creation You are worthy
have been so good to us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for sending your one and only son down to die on the cross for each and every one of us, God. We didn't deserve it, Lord. But Lord, thank you, Lord, for loving us that much. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us now as we get into your word, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord. We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. There we go. How are we doing, Nightlife? <laughs> Thankful to see all of you here uh, this evening. It's been a super powerful night. I want to invite to the stage uh, two mission teams that are heading out, one to Uganda and one to Philadelphia. <laughs> Candace, these are power people. Wait, Jennifer, Jennifer Revelo, where, where are you going? Huh? You're, you're, <laughs> wait, are you going to Uganda or are you going to Philadelphia? You're going to Philly. All right. So the Philly team right here. Let's give it up, Philly. Uganda team. Let's give it up. Candace, wait a second. My whole security team is leaving. <laughs> What is going on here? Uh, Candace, why don't you come on over here and tell us about Philly and tell us, where, where are you going, first and foremost? Uh, I'll be going to both trips. Uh, oh. This time. <laughs> Praise God. Go Impact! <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> Wait, time out. Did Zach give approval for you to be gone this long? He did. I'll talk to him, okay? <laughs> What's going on in Uganda? So Uganda will be partnering with the Calvary Chapel Kampala and various church plants in the villages to do children's ministry, women's ministry, and men's ministry while we're there. Amen. Amen. Um, so like men's life and women's life. Yes. Okay. And kid life. Yes, okay. Very exactly. good. Yes. And what's the name of our church, Candace? <laughs> Calvary Life! <laughs> <laughs> now, how long have you been here, Candace? Uh, since 19. Oh, no. I'm talking about this week. Like how... <laughs> How, how many hours have you put in this week? Wait, 1988? That was when I was born. <laughs> 1998, 1998. Uh, whoa, L, 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 L. Okay, now tell us about Philly. Awesome. So Philly will be working with the inner city. We're doing a three-day camp where they're going to bus kids in and we'll be able to minister, share testimonies, uh, and just really uh, love on the kids as Christ has loved us. Amen. Amen. Now, do they know that Jennifer Arevalo is going? <laughs> yes, they're fully aware. I don't know if you yeah. know Jennifer. This is like a force of nature. You can feel her presence right here. Um, come here, Jennifer. Yeah. yeah, of course you. Come here. Come here. Um, <laughs> Jennifer, are you excited about this trip? Of course, yeah. because we're serving great God. So Amen. <laughs> I'm expecting great things already. Amen. All right, come on, team. Don't be afraid. Come forward. We're going to pray for you guys. Come on, Uganda. Uganda, come on. Gary, they're taking you too? My goodness. <laughs> hey, church, we want to lay hands on this team. So we're going to ask again, would you just lift your hands towards them as we pray for them to go make impact for the gospel? Would you pray along with me? Father, I'm just so thankful for everybody up here. I'm just looking at people that I love overwhelmed as they take steps of faith to follow you. And Lord, I know that they've worked hard. They have donated themselves. They have raised funds all for your namesake. They've made many sacrifices using vacation time. Lord, they've decided to follow you, no turning back. So I'm asking by the power of your spirit, as they go, would they make impact? Lord, I pray that you would use them in a powerful way. I ask God that they would see miracles. Because Jennifer's right. We serve a great God. And you're able to do immeasurably more than all we ask, think, or even imagine. So, Lord, I pray you'd let them dream their dreams and see them come to pass. That you'd give them vision and that when they return, they'll be more excited about the gospel and ignite our fire to serve in a more faithful way. Thank you, Lord, for them. Watch over them, protect, and keep them. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys.
Speaking of Pastor Steve Mayo, um, last, uh, if you remember, last week he tried to show me up by doing a spoken word to open up nightlife, thinking I'm just some regular old white guy, right? <laughs> Take a look at the screen. This is what he did last week. Take a look at the screen. Life can feel uphill like we on a grace climb. Gotta stay connected like we on a FaceTime. But we can't waste time. So preach the gospel and tell them hell is hot like LeBron on the baseline. See, out in a foreign country or here in the drive through If you chilling at in and out they need the Lord too. See. So he went in the back and I went, really? Are you serious? So I thought I would open up 1 Chronicles 13 <laughs> with a little spoken word myself. You ready for this? Yeah. Here we go. Shh. I messed up. I came into the room and I confessed up. I tried to take it all into my own hands, so I gave up. But you see, I thought it was right. I thought we could take the covenant to the light. Does it matter how? Does it matter now? Yes, I can see why it matters. Wow. He told me, he told me carry it, but I put it on a cart. I looked over and saw us, a blood on my hands, blood on my heart. Did it matter how? Is what he did foul? I didn't look into the word, not one verse. I didn't even speak to the Lord to see him work. So who am I to judge what he did? Who am I? All of him is holy, yeah his word over mine. And to Steve Mayo, I know you were thinking that you are so fine. But I also know you're listening intently online. So I've got a simple message for you. Yes, I do. Roses are red and violets are blue. You tried to outdo me, but I just outdid you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if <laughs> hey, listen, if the pastor thing don't work, I'm going on, I'm going on the road. <laughs> oh, I wish I could put Steve on the phone right now. I love that guy. Love that guy. Hey, listen, we're going to be in First Chronicles chapter 13. If you can get serious at this point, right? First Chronicles chapter 13. Uh, we're going to, if you don't have a Bible, make sure you get one from the seat back pocket. And if you uh, actually don't actually have a Bible, that's yours. Take it with you. Let me tell you what happens here. We do funerals a lot here at uh, Calvary Life. And people want to donate all the time when we do a funeral, but we don't take money for funerals. That's a ministry that we do as pastors. And sometimes families will insist and um, we will tell them, great. We will take this money, not use it for ourselves. We're going to use this money to buy Bibles for the people in our church. So every time you hear me say, if you don't have a Bible, it's in memory of your loved one. Amen? Amen. First Chronicles 13, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I'm so thankful that you've given us your word. And whether it's a spoken word or a simple word, your word is power. It needs nothing else besides the Spirit of God to confirm in our hearts. Spirit, as I saw all of those cars out there and all of those people, I'm grateful that you gave us an example to catch people in fishing nets. So we'll do anything. We'll throw any net, any way, anyhow to save one. Because the Bible says that Paul became all things to all main men to save some one person. So I pray tonight for salvation in God's precious Holy Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, let's do a little bit of a review. David is now the king of Israel. He's gathered his army to establish his rule. And we talked about the kind of guys that David gathered. They were strong men. And these guys, they were willing to lay their lives down, listen carefully, for their king. That should sound familiar, church. Willing to lay their life down for their king. First Chronicles, pick it up in chapter 12. Uh, First Chronicles chapter 12, we'll pick it up in verse 38. 
all these men of war who could keep ranks, came to Hebron with a loyal heart to make David king over all Israel and all the rest of Israel were of one mind to make David king. I'll stop there if you would for a moment. They were men of war. These guys were ready to fight the good fight of faith. Church, listen. They were ready to fight. They had trained, they were prepared, they had gone through boot camp. When the devil came their way, when the enemy came their way, they did not run from him, they fought the good fight. They were men of war. They could keep ranks. Now let me tell you what this Bible is getting across. They had courage and they had strength in the heat of the battle. They didn't run away crying, I can't believe this is happening. No, 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 not these guys. The Bible says they had a face of a lion. Maybe just imagine this big burly beard guy coming at you. They were not going to back down. They also had a loyal heart. What the Bible is saying is they were committed to whatever their king asked them to do, they were gonna do it. This This verse is a picture of the church. And in 1 Chronicles 12, verse 39, would you take a look? And they, and they were there with David three days, eating and drinking for their brethren had prepared for them. Moreover, those who were near to them from as far as away as Issachar and Zebulun and Naphtali were bringing food on donkeys and camels and mules and oxen. I mean, there's about 100,000 guys. Of course they're bringing food. Provisions of flour and cakes of figs and cakes of raisins. That's like dessert. Wine and oil and oxen, so beef and sheep, abundantly, for there was joy in Israel. Look at that, for there was joy in Israel. Hey, gang, they're having a three-day feast. Let me tell you something about these guys. David knew how to throw a party. Three days. When we throw a party, we can't wait till 9 o'clock comes comes for you to get out my house. Seriously. We don't know how to do parties. The Hebrews knew how to do parties three days. And David knew guys. He just kept bringing the food. He brought them in donkeys. It was like semi-trucks of beef and sheep and dessert, cakes of raisins. Now, well, it's funny because cakes of raisins was considered uh, an aphrodisiac. When Solomon built the temple, he gave everyone a cake of raisin. And what he was telling all of the couples, go home and have children. That's what he was telling them. So David's like, he's got a three-day party going on. What is happening? Oh, my goodness. Guys, these guys are having a good time. They're loving on their wives. They're enjoying festivity and fellowship. They're filled with joy, and they had just come out of a battle with Saul. They'd lost friends. They'd gone through a struggle. Church, can I tell you something? It's okay for Christians to have fun. It's okay. I I wish our Bible, uh, if we were writing a Bible about Calvary Life, for there was joy at Calvary Life. For there was joy at Calvary Life. Let me tell you something. Christians can actually smile. Christians can laugh. I I see so many Christians, as soon as they start laughing, they go like, (laughs) it's almost like it's sinful to laugh. Christians can actually enjoy. In fact, John Piper, he says this, joy is a good feeling of the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he actually causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and the beauty of Christ in the world. In fact, let me tell you about joy. Joy is evidence that the Spirit is flowing through you. It's a fruit of the Spirit. So listen, turn the frown upside down. We can actually be joyful. Let me tell you what Jesus said. Jesus said that the Christian life is blessed. Every beatitude begins with blessed are you, blessed are you. And that word means happy, happy. You see, he even says we can be blessed when we're persecuted. You see, our joy is not found in our situation or circumstance. Our joy is rooted in Jesus. Listen to what Jesus said. It's John 15, 11. He said this. These things I've spoken to you, I've given you my word, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Have you ever been downhearted and someone comes to you to cheer you up? Have you ever been downhearted and someone comes to cheer you up? This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you'll get in my word, my word will always lift you up and give you joy. The problem is that the devil wants to keep you from the word when you're feeling miserable. you got to get to the word. And even in our worst moments, 
Our joy is grounded in our faith by believing what Jesus promises for us. Take a look at John chapter 16. It'll be on the screen. Therefore, you now have sorrow. Jesus gets it. I've told you I'm leaving. I know you're sorrowful. He understands sorrow. The Bible says he was a man of sorrow. It doesn't mean sorrow won't come. It just means we've got joy. But I will see you again. He's speaking about the resurrection. The promise that he gave them. And your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. Has your favorite team ever been down and you thought they could never come back? But in the fourth quarter, in the last two minutes, they score a touchdown and win the game. Do you go like this? Woo. Because that's how some of us worship. Woo. Seriously. Jesus rose from the dead and he told them, the promise of the resurrection will bring you joy. And can I tell you something? I don't care what happens to you in this life. Though you may die, you will rise again. That should give us joy. And that's what Jesus is saying here. And the joy that we have even in the midst of trial, Peter says, it's inexpressible. You can't describe it in words. It's only realized in your spirit. And though your outward body wastes away, let me tell you something about your inner man. It is being renewed day by day. Let me tell you something. You guys know sweet Jocelyn. All of us know her. She's the one that sits over here and screams. I was by her deathbed yesterday and she's on her way to glory so I kneeled down by her bed and I whispered in her ear when peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say. She started to laugh. I said, stop laughing at my voice. <laughs> it is well, it is well with my soul. And then I went like this. It is well. And she went like this. Mm -hmm. With my soul. She went, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And though her outward man is perishing, her spirit is alive with joy. So I don't know what your situation is, but I know if you get to him in his word, he'll give you joy. And during this festivity that David's holding, he decides, all my leaders are here. He decides, I'm going to have a leadership meeting. I, I got I to gotta tell them what's on my heart. My first step is the leader. Oh my goodness, the assembly is here. I've got to meet with them. And look what happens in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 1. Then, here at the party, David consulted with the captains and the thousands and the hundreds with every leader. David said to all the assembly, so the leaders of Israel, if it seems good to you, and if it seems, uh, and if it is of the Lord of our God, let us send out to our brethren everywhere who are left in all the land of Israel and with them to the priests and the Levites who are in their cities and their common lands that they may gather together to us and let us bring the ark of our God back to us. For We've not inquired of it since the days of Saul. Stop there if you would. As the first active king, David wants to bring the ark of God back to Jerusalem. He wants to initiate his ministry by putting God first, so it seems. The ark, the ark, it represents the power and the presence and the proclamation God is in the camp. And David he wants to, the people to refocus on who is important, not what is important. But David knew something as the king, a Jewish Hebrew king. He needed the power of God. 
He needed the people to see that God was behind him. He needed the presence of God. And he wanted God's rule, his proclamation, his word to be throughout the land. Now, before I go on with the ark, I don't want you to confuse this ark with Noah's ark. Okay? Two different arks. This ark, to my, to your, my, is this my stage right? Okay, here we go. My stage right. You know what I just did? Um, I've done this my whole life. As soon as I decide like right or left, my finger, my hands do this. This is left, Chet. This is left. Um, so to my stage right, okay, you see the ark. Now let me tell you what the ark is. It was a symbol to the Jewish nation that God was with the people and that the people were with God. Now it was just a wooden box covered with gold. Normal material. But when God anoints something and says that normal is holy, let me tell you something, he did it with you. Normal person, he anointed you with his son and made you holy. That's just what he does. Now, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4, the ark was a box and inside of it, it had memory things because God is big into memory. He, wanted, he had a, a, a golden pot of manna. Aaron's rod that budded was there in the box. And there were the Ten Commandments, the tablets. The Ten Commandments were there in the box. And what these represented to the people was God's provision in the manna, God's plan, and God's purpose for his people. That's what the box represented, the ark. Now let me tell you what this ark did. It was to be the focus of Hebrew life. Now take a look at the screen, if you would, for a moment. During the 40 years of wandering... God told the children of Israel that some were to be the east, west, north, and south of the ark. He even told the tribes where exactly their place was. And I hope you're beginning to see from that picture that God was already giving the plan of redemption by showing them the cross and Jesus in the center. It was already a plan. God's plan of redemption was since the creation of the world. If you look at this picture, you can't help but see that God was reaching out to his people with the plan of redemption, even by the way they placed them. And every tent was to open looking at the ark, being reminded every morning of the presence of God. It was the focus of Hebrew life. But unfortunately, 25 years before David was king, God was with the people, but the people were not with God. Uh, Let me take a commercial break from 1 Chronicles 13 and catch you up with some history. During the time of the judges, it was a godless time in Israel. Godless. It almost like they could care less of God. That's why the book of Ruth is so important, because in the midst of so much godliness, there was one couple who decided to stand for God. And God always has a remnant, even in L.A. Look at us. He always has a remnant of faithful few. So in fact, during this time of the judges, the daughter of the high priest actually named her child Ichabod, which means the glory of the Lord departed. She named her child that because she saw that even God couldn't cope with the godlessness of the children of Israel. So she named her child Ichabod so that she recognized the presence and the power of God was out of Israel. Unfortunately, during this time, the Philistines, the enemy of Israel, they attacked. And the Israelites were losing bad. So they came up with an idea. Go get the ark! So they brought the ark into the battle and they were thinking the ark would save them, but God was nowhere near them. And they thought the ark would save them. It wasn't that they believed in God. They believed that the ark was like a lucky charm. That's what they believed. Um, Let me give you an example. It would be like holding the cross around your neck when a policeman pulls you over for speeding. It's like, oh, please don't let me get a ticket. Please don't let me get a ticket. The cross is just a lucky charm at that point. You broke the law. You deserve a ticket, okay? Even if you bat your eyes, you still deserve the ticket. Let me tell you something. It's so unfair that women get pulled over. And because when a a female cop pulls you over, she's got no compassion for a guy. But when a male cop pulls over a female cop and they go, hi, something happens in their heart. It's unfair. That wasn't in my notes. But even when they brought the ark of God, the Israelites still lost because God was Ichabod. He wasn't there. 
And the Philistines carried the ark out of Israel to a place where their God was, Dagon. It's called Ashdod, is the city. And Dagon was a god who kind of looked like this. So they put the ark right in front of Dagon. And the next morning they came and Dagon was flat on his face. So they had to pick him up and put him back on his pedestal. Now I got a little side note here. Anytime you have to pick up your God, that's a problem. <laughs> like if you actually have to help your God out, that's an issue. So the next morning they came in, he fell down again, but his head and his hands were cut off. It's like God's saying, are you guys kidding me? So the Philistines, they decide, we got to move this ark to other cities in uh, uh, the Philistine. So they moved it to Gath. Then they moved it to Ekron. But every time they moved the ark, it broke, people broke out in plague and thousands of people died. You know what God was telling them? You defeated my people, but you haven't touched me. You haven't defeated me. My people were sinful, so I'm not with them, but I need to let you know I'm alive and well. Don't play with me. That's what he was telling them. So the Philistines, they make a decision. We got to get this thing out of here. So they put the ark, listen carefully, they put the ark on a new cart. They put two cows in front of the ark, carrying it, and they just let it go back to Israel. Well, when the children of Israel saw the ark coming back on a cart, they were so excited that they lifted up the lid and 50,000 people died immediately. So those people from Beth Shemesh, they said to a town about 20 miles away, we don't want the ark, we just lost all of our guys. Can you come get it? So they came, put it on their shoulders the way that it's supposed to be held, and they carried it to Kirjath Jerem. That was 25 years before David was in power. But now it seems that David wants to revive the faith of the Hebrews to bring back the power and the presence and the proclamation of God by bringing the ark to Jerusalem. But what God's going to do is reveal his real motives. And we're going to see what's going on in David's heart. First Chronicles, take a look at verse thir chapter 13, verse 1. Then David consulted with the captains. Stop there. There's his first problem. He didn't consult with God. And this is going to be a huge mistake. In fact, if you don't consult with God, it's a huge mistake in your life. In fact, the theme of First Chronicles is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not people. Don't call Oprah when you got a problem. <laughs> Don't call Dr. Phil. Don't go on to a site and definitely don't call 1-800-PSYCHIC-FRIENDS. Let me tell you something. Get to God. You see, one of the themes that we will see in 1 Chronicles, the kings that sought God succeeded. The kings that did not seek God failed. So who wants to be a failure? Raise your hand. So the rule is, seek God. Listen to what Jesus said. In Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things, they're just going to be added unto you. Jesus is making it clear, clear. God's got to be our priority. He's got to be our number one consultant. Hey, God, where do you want me to work? Where do you want me to live? Do you want me to retire? Where do you want me to go to school? What would you like for me to do today? Where would you like for me to send my children to school? Should I go private? Should I go public? God, what do you want for them? Not what do I want for them? They're yours anyway. Jesus says, we got to run after God and trust him to take care of everything else. In other words, if we seek God, he's going to lead us to his provision for his li our lives. He's going to lead us to fulfill his promise in our life. He's going to lead us to reveal his plan in his life. I just talked to someone the other day. I found my wife. I said, what's her last name? I don't know. <laughs> then I said, have you prayed about it? Oh, you pray about those things? You pray about everything. You pray about everything because Seeking God brings success. Take a look at verse 2. 
And David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, and if it is of the Lord our God. Yeah, we got another problem here. Look at verse 4. Then all of the assembly said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the... Do you see the Holy Spirit, what he's doing? He's, he's unveiling the plot. David wanted to please the people before pleasing God. There's an old saying, listen carefully. You can please some of the people all of the time. You can please all of the people some of the time. But you can't please all of the people all of the time. Can I tell you that people pleasing is a dangerous trap? Jesus knew it. John chapter 2, he knew people pleasing was a trap. Jesus did not com commit himself to them because he knows people. He knows all men. He had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. People pleasing. People change on a dime. One day they love you, the next day they scream, crucify him. They change on a dime. They change on a dime. Listen to what Paul says, okay, about people pleasing. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I wouldn't be a bondservant of Jesus. I'd be a servant of people. And I'm not a servant of people. I'm a servant of God. Now, this doesn't mean we act like a jerk to everybody. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay, listen carefully. It means that my priority is pleasing God over pleasing people. Here's the point. Please God as your priority and leave people up to him. Amen. I got a text from a pastor friend of mine. Hey, uh, I heard you changed your name. Um, I'm sure we're going to get quite a few people from your church that are disgruntled and angry and mad. So I was just wondering, um, what would you like for me to say to them? So I text him back. God changed our name, so people have a problem with him, not me. <laughs> See, be careful. We've got to be careful not to be men pleasers. Our call is to please God as his servant. We're not the servant of people. But you've also got to be careful that you're not rude and mean, because you're not a man pleaser. <laughs> I don't please men. <laughs> I'm people. No, 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 that's not what we're talking about. Because in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, look what the Bible says about Jesus. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor, take a look at the order, with God and men. You see, as Jesus grew in favor with God, the fruit was favor with men. It just simply means to make sure you're pleasing God as your priority, like Paul said. It makes you a servant of God, not of people. Now take a look at verse 5, if you would. 1 Chronicles 13. So David gathered all Israel together from Shire and Egypt to as far as the entrance of Hamath to bring the ark of God from kirjath Jerem. And remember the story of how it got there. David and all of Israel went up to Bala, to kirjath Jerem, which belonged to Judah, to bring, up from the ark of, to bring up from there the ark of God the Lord, who dwells between the cherubim where his name is proclaimed. So they carry the ark of God on a new cart, sound familiar? On a new cart from the house of Abinadab and Uzzah and Ohio, I don't know why Ohio is mentioned here, drove the cart. So we gotta go back to the commercial break. Remember when I was giving you the story of how the ark got there 25 years ago? When the Philistines were returning the ark, they returned it on a new cart back to Israel. This blows my mind. Because the people of God are copying the way of the world in order to worship. Well, if the Philistines do it, we should do it. They put it on a new cart, we should put it on a new cart. Instead of digging into the word to discover how God wants to be worshiped, they decided to copy the world. You see, the ark, if they would have done the research, it was to be carried by Levites, not put on a new cart. But they remember 25 years ago when the ark came on that cart and they thought, well, nothing happened to the Philistines. They're unbelievers. They don't know how to live a godly life. God's not going to judge them for what they don't know. So they decided to just bring the world right into worship. Here's the point. 
Don't bring the world into the worship of God. Thus, we will never have a fundraising thermometer at this church. This is Calvary Life. And the world, the world has a way to attract people to follow. Think of commercials. They use beauty. They use intimacy. They use emotions and strength. They use our desires to attract us to follow. That's why the beautiful girl is always putting on that perfume and doing her hair like this. Because as you women watch that, you think to yourself, if I buy that perfume, I could have hair like that. And you guys... You're going through the airport and you see that stud wearing that watch. And you think to yourself, I could have those muscles if I just buy that watch. And you buy that watch and you wake up the next morning extremely disappointed. They use all of these tactics to trick you. Let me tell you what God told Samuel. Because man looks at the outward appearance. The world knows that. But God looks at the hearts. You know what amazes me? They even, use, they even use worship. They use catchy tunes. Singing and dancing along as the narrator is telling you, this drug could kill you. You could have a heart attack. You can do this. But the woman is just like going like this. She's dancing. She's, you know, doing her deal. And, she, and the, whole, the, the commentator is just going, you will die if you take this drug. But she's dancing. And then we go, I want that drug. It's amazing to me. We'll even leave the commercial. To all be Patty's special sauce. Now, I know that's an old one I just dated myself, but I don't watch a lot of TV nowadays. Now, let me tell you something. They put a jingle in our heart. They pervert worship. But God describes the way that he wants to be worshiped. It's John chapter 4, verse 24. Listen to what Jesus said. God's spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit. We got spirit. Yes, we do. We got spirit. How about you? (laughs) And truth in spirit. This spirit springs from our love for God. And the Holy Spirit in us desires to glorify Jesus. And Paul describes what this love of God looks like. It's peaceful. That's why you don't see a lot of crazy people at Calvary Life, because worship is peaceful. It's long-suffering. We'll sing for 30 minutes. It's kind. You don't see a lot of mean people. I love Jesus. (laughs) It's good. (laughs) That wasn't in my notes either. It's faithful. It's gentle. And it's self-controlled. That's the spirit But in truth, this means we worship God God's way, not our way. So we don't all speak in tongues at one time because 1 Corinthians 14 says that he's a God of order, not of confusion. And he says, that's the way I want to worship, period. In Ephesians 5, 19 and 20, he says, speak to one another in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs. In other words, we sing the word of God to each other. We're reminding each other of how great God is. The psalm says that we should proclaim his, in singing, we should shout to the Lord. Jesus. And some of you should sing this softly because we've heard your voices. I actually think it's an act of grace on your part. (laughs) Terry, I love you, but you sing great. 1 Corinthians 13, now take a look at verse 8. Then David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on cymbals, and with trumpets. 1 Samuel chapter 6, you can read the story. 1 Samuel chapter 6, same story. We find out there were 30,000 people there, 30,000 person worship service. This is quite a scene. Can you imagine the celebration, the women dancing, the trumpets going off, the drum beating? They're on their road to Jerusalem, and they are worked up in emotions. Let me tell you something. Being spiritual 
may be emotional, but being emotional may not be spiritual. We got to remember that God looks at the heart, not at the performance. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul gives us an indication of the heart. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, not, to, not, not what I think is acceptable, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He says our worship is being a living sacrifice, that our whole life we're living a holy life. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it explains it further. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, in other words, your life show what's good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. He says, listen, a living sacrifice is someone who wants to look like Jesus more and more each and every day. So let me tell you something. You come to church, and it's not wrong. You can shout. You can cry. You can scream hallelujah, but if your heart's not right, let me tell you what it sounds like. Clang, 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 clang in heaven. That's what it sounds like. There's no love. You don't have a love for God. It's just a performance. There's nothing wrong with any of those things, but if your heart's not right, all heaven hears is a clanging cymbal. Be careful. First Corinthians Chronicles 13, verse 9. Now remember, I'm African. This is the first closing. There'll be seven more. <laughs> and when they came to Chidon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and he struck him because he put his hand. So he died because he put his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. He got so mad, therefore that place is called Perez Uzzah, the outbreak of God against Uzzah to this day. Whoa. Whoa, take a look. Take a look at the screen if you would. There's kirjath Jerem. there is the threshing floor, and there is Jerusalem. They're about halfway there. And on their way there, I want you to imagine the scene. Do, 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 ah, Jesus, or God at this point. You know, oh, everyone just dancing and singing. And one of the ox fall into a pothole and fall over. And Uzzah goes, whoa, and touches the ark. And he's dead. Sounds like a party pooper to me. Like this is a major Debbie Downer. There is nothing like sucking the life out of a party if someone dies. And the whole place went silent. Now, you might think this is harsh. Uzzah was a Levite. He knew the ark should be carried, but he went with the crowd instead of doing what God told him to do. He went with the whole crowd, 30,000 people. Let me explain what it is. This would be like a nuclear power engineer thinking that he could walk into reactor without no protective gear. Something bad's gonna happen. David should have sought the Lord. And in front of 30,000 people, he's learning a very strong lesson. Glorify God his way, not your way. It's so learning a very powerful lesson. And can I say, we don't get to choose how we're going to glorify God or if we will glorify God. We don't get to choose that. Because there's many people in this world who say, I am not going to glorify God in this life, and that you think you're getting away with it. I want to tell you what the Bible says. One day, every knee is going to bow. So you think you're getting away with it, but there's a life after death, one with God and one without. But for believers, we're bowing the knee every day. So we can't say, I don't like bowing. It hurts. I don't like bowing. I got arthritis. I could get knobs on my knees and I wear shorts. I don't want people to see knobs on my knees and calluses on my knees. No, I'm talking about a spiritual bow in our heart where we are purposing to glorify God and there are some things that God asks us to do that we don't like. Let me mention one. Here it is. <laughs> you ready? 
half the people of the church will leave with this one. Ready? <laughs> Tithe. Give 10% of your income to the Lord. No one walked out, so we're still good. <laughs> Here's another one. Love your enemy. So what I want you to do right now is think of the person you can't stand at work. Go ahead, think of them. Think of them. Now I want you to, in your mind to run up to them and give them a big hug and say, I love you. <laughs> Whoa, God, you got me there. I can do the tithe thing. But like that person, <laughs> I'm hoping they go to hell on a roller coaster. I mean, they are evil. You can't say you're glorifying God if you're glorifying God your way. You gotta glorify God his way. So I'm gonna give you some advice from Mother Mary. All my Roman Catholics, I'm giving you some advice from Mother Mary. This is what she told the servants. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. You gotta glorify God his way. And take a look at David's reaction. He's angry. Can I tell you something about your faith? Your faith is revealed when you hit a pothole in life. Your faith is revealed. Because potholes have a tendency to shake out what's inside of us. Let me give you an example. Andrew was pregnant in Liberia, and there are potholes everywhere. And you know what, like the first three months of pregnancy, you're sick all the time? So we're in the car, and let me tell you about taxis. They're little four-door sedans. Two people sit in the front, four people sit in the back. So two people are in the front bucket seat, and four people are in the back of like a, of a Honda, okay? It's like a tiny little car. So you're like this, pothole, and she's pregnant, and I see her go green. And with one pothole, she looked at the Liberian woman next to her. Thank God she turned her way and not my way. She looked at the Liberian woman and went, Bleh. One pothole, everything inside of her came outside of her, and the sweet Liberian woman looked at her and said, girl, I understand. You ever hit a pothole in life and something comes out of your mouth that you thought you'd never say? You ever hit a pothole in life and you did something you thought you would never do? David was so upset with God, he renamed the city. This is where God took out Uzzah. Whoa. God, this is your fault. You ever blame God? You ever blame God when it's your fault? Like your heart is broken because you dated an unbeliever and you look up to heaven and you go, how did you let this happen to me, God? <laughs> let all the single ladies, all the single ladies, let everybody say amen. <laughs> I don't hear you, amen. amen. Alyssa, you're not single. <laughs> <laughs> Let's close it up. Final closing. Verse 12. 1 Chronicles 13, verse 12. Bible says David was afraid of God that day, saying, how can I bring the ark of God to me? See, something about David, David was a man after God's own heart. So later on that day, David gets convicted. You ever said something you shouldn't have said and you feel bad about it? I want to see hands. Okay, so we all understand where, <laughs> whoa, easy there. <laughs> we, we all understand where David's at. We've all done this. And then God tells us you need to go say sorry. So God's spirit is convicting David and he realizes I shouldn't have done that. And he says, how can I bring the ark of God to me? Finally, God gets his heart, he's convicted and he prays out loud He's speaking to God. He's finally consulting with God. And we're going to get the answer from God in a couple of weeks. And he makes a great decision. Look at 13. So David would not move the ark with him into the city of David, but took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. See, here's what happened. David makes a good, good decision, and here's what it is, and maybe you'll write it down. I'm not moving forward until I know what God wants me to do. I'm not moving forward. This is a powerful lesson to learn, for all of us to learn. Now, 
Uzzah has died. Could you be Obed-Edom for just a moment? David goes, hey, we're going to leave the ark at your house. Excuse me? (laughs) (laughs) David, I know you're the king, but (laughs) that's the ark. (laughs) Obed-Edom accepted it because his house was already prepared to receive the presence of God. If I had to show up to your house with the ark, what movies on Netflix are you going to have to get rid of? The other day, I went on my children's account of Netflix, and I called one of them, and I said, I didn't know you watched those movies. Oh, Dad, I, I, well, it's my husband. <laughs> Thank you, Eve. Is your house ready for the presence of God to come in? Because I want you to see what happens. God blessed the house of Obed-Edom because that's the heart of God for his people. He doesn't want to wipe people out. He desires to bless people and for his people to be blessed. So stop moving forward without him so he can start blessing you. And let me tell you about the blessed life found in God. Jesus said it's abundant. You'll feel fulfilled. You won't wake up the next morning with so much grief. Let me tell you about the life of God. You'll have peace, a peace that passes understanding, an inexpressible joy. Who doesn't want that kind of blessing in their life? And God says, then consult me for every decision and watch how I'll bless you. And let me tell you something the greatest decision you can consult God for is where you're going to spend your eternity. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We are overwhelmed by your great grace that you give us access to discover what's best for our life. And so many Christians don't tap into the resource of the Creator who has all of our days planned. So, Lord, we commit our lives to you and we pray, help us to consult you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, church. I don't know if you're here tonight and you were invited by a friend and you've not been consulting God for a long time. And you're wondering, why do I feel so empty? You're wondering, wow, this guy's making sense. Because the Spirit of God is talking to you and he's saying to you, talk to me about your eternal life. Because I sent my son to die for you. I sent my son the best I had because I love you so much. And he lived the life you couldn't live because I require perfection to come to heaven and I knew you couldn't do it because you pulled your little sister's hair when you were five years old. That disqualifies you from heaven. So I sent my son and he lived the life you couldn't live. And because he did that, he then paid the price of your sin and that price was death, separation from me for eternity. He didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave three days later. And because he rose from the dead, he's the only one that can give you eternal life. As Christians, do you hear them? Oh, yes. Let me tell you why. They know peace. They know joy. They know exactly what I'm saying. And every time I give the gospel, it reminds them of what they have in Christ but you're sitting there and you're wondering, what am I doing in this church? I just brought my car for people to watch and see it. And now I'm listening to this and I feel funny inside. Is it the street dog or is this the spirit? His name is Jesus and he's knocking on your heart and he's saying, I'm the best decision that you can make. So here's what I'm gonna do. 
Tonight, I wanna offer you a gift. It's the gift of salvation. I didn't do anything for it. I just got to offer it. You can know tonight that you're right with God. You can know tonight that you're going to heaven. You can know tonight you're forgiven. Nothing like being forgiven. There's a peace about forgiveness. So tonight I'm gonna ask you to make the best decision of your life. And here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to get up out of your seat and come forward and make your life right with God. Pastor, I can't come in front of all these people. Let me tell you what they're gonna do. They're gonna erupt in applause and they're gonna let you know we're with you because their life has been changed and they want your life changed. So listen, don't be afraid. You come forward. We're gonna receive you right here. Now, why am I asking you to come forward? Because Jesus asked his people to come forward. Amen. 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 Good decision, man. Good decision. So if that's you, get up out of your seat, come forward, give your life to the Lord. Why don't you lead us in a song? Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Good job, Christian. Amen. Good job, Kevin. God bless you. I love you. <laughs> Amen. 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 Hey, listen. You're sitting in your seat. You're wrestling. The enemy's lying to you. He's saying to you, don't do it, don't do it. He wants to keep you in darkness, but the spirit is still pulling you. That's that uneasiness you feel. If that's you and you're sitting in your chair, you get up out of your seat and you come forward. I just wanna wait for you just a minute. I just wanna wait for you just a minute. Make your life right with God. Yeah, amen, God bless you. Amen, we'll wait for you. Great decision. God bless you, good decision. Great, amen, God bless you. Amen. Yeah, I see you coming. God bless you, man. Good decision. Great decision. Amen. God bless you. Good job. Good job. Amen. Amen. Great decision. Hey, listen. You've not joined our church. We don't even have a church membership. You're coming into the family of God. You're making your life right with God. And Lou, Lou, hey Lou, you took a courageous step of faith and take a look at what happened. So I wanna lead you in a prayer. And I know it's gonna be my words, but just let it come from your heart. And because we believe in glorifying God together, we're all gonna say it with you just to let you know, we got your back, we're with you. So would you pray this with me, dear Jesus? I believe in you. I want to be right with you. Please forgive me. Thank you, Jesus, that today I'm saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, listen, you see Pastor Pat right here? Pastor Pat is right there, he's waving a Bible. We just wanna give you a Bible and a Bible study and pray with you for just a moment. Um, Pastor Pat is right here. If you would just go with him for just a moment, listen, the parking lot is a nightmare anyway, so give it a few minutes, okay? I say it all the time. So go with Pastor Pat, you'll be back with your friends in a minute. We just wanna pray with you, give you a Bible and a Bible study, great decision. Church, let's give it up for him as they go. Amen. Um, if any of you want Steve Mayo's email to let him know how well I did. <laughs> I love that man to death. We have such a great, um, this kind of brother relationship. So listen, our God's a great God. Let's close in worship and let him know how thankful we are for what he did tonight. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord.
start to believe that you weren't sufficient for me. Why do I talk myself?